Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks again for having me this morning. And uh, as your pastor, Pastor Phil, mentioned, I am his older cousin. Uh, there's a little bit, you know, we're the gray competition. I'm beating him slightly, but I'm, I am slightly older. Uh, I have known Phil my entire life. Uh, in fact, I feel like I need to mention this morning, uh, your frame of reference for Pastor Phil has been relegated to his experience here as pastor. Uh, but I have known him throughout my entire life. I knew him before he was ever called Pastor Phil. I just knew Phil. And I feel like, you know, knowing you since you were a boy, I just feel like to begin, I want to describe him to you just for a moment. From my experience growing up, oh boy, there are so many adjectives. So many adjectives I could use to describe amazing. Phil. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> Let's just say he was active. I think that's a good way to describe him this morning. He was, he was very active. That's a little more politically correct. That's probably better than to say he was slightly wild, right? Active? <laughs> we'll stick with that. Active. He was active as a child. I, on the other hand, was much more passive growing up. Uh, I was calm and I was reserved and I would probably describe myself best by saying I was timid. That's probably a good way to describe myself when I was younger. Ever since I was young, uh, I remember having feelings uh, of, of fear and anxiousness. Uh, I, I won't go into all the particulars, but just to give a, a little bit of a frame of reference. When I was very young, I had a series of kind of traumatic medical experiences that kind of marked my life and derailed me for several years when I was growing up. And as a result of some of those experiences, as a child, I battled anxiety quite a bit. It was a major struggle for me. I lived with a, a constant fear that something bad might happen to me. Uh, in fact, things got so difficult there for a while that I actually, I got special permission from my elementary school uh, to carry around a pager with me. So I had like a, a lifeline to my family in case they needed to contact me, because I was so anxious. Uh, and by the way, I feel the need to, to mention this uh, and explain what a pager is. So if you, <laughs> if you were alive in the 1900s, like I was, uh, there was a little technological device, young people, uh, called a pager or a beeper, that you could essentially text, kind of not really, uh, a number to this little thing. And it would beep or buzz, and you would look, look at the pager, and it would have a callback number. And then you could call the person and, and figure things out. That was what a pager was. Anyways... Carried that in my pocket in elementary school because I was just so nervous, so anxious that something could happen, and I wanted to make sure that my, my family could contact me. See, the truth is fear, worry, anxiety, these were emotions that dominated much of my childhood. These were feelings that robbed me of significant joy over the years. And every so often, if I'm honest, some of these same feelings creep back up into my life. So what do we do about this nagging challenge, this problem known as anxiety? How do we navigate through this complex emotional hurdle that's often rearing its ugly head in our life? Well, that's going to be the question I want to examine this morning. And to, to find an answer, uh, I want you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Philippians, because we're going to find a passage where the Apostle Paul is going to speak to this challenge, this problem of anxiety. So uh, Philippians 4 is where you should be at already uh, through the reading we had today. And again, I just want to begin by saying what a privilege and an honor it is for me to be here today, uh, Phil, Pastor Phil. Uh, it's thoroughly just a, a joy to join him in worship and to be part of a church that he's been a part of for many years, to see all you. Uh, my connection, obviously, through this church is through Pastor Phil, but also I've followed you guys online, so I'm familiar a little bit with this congregation. I also know uh, that over the last couple months, last couple years, really, there's been some transition here. And I know that, uh, that transitions can be challenging sometimes in, in a church. In fact, I have experienced quite a bit of transition in my church in Frankenmuth. Uh, we went through a season of significant transition, uh, probably about a decade ago, and uh, it was challenging. And so I just want to say uh, that I, I know what transition is like. I'm going to share a little more about that later. But I want you to know that, again, I'm, I'm thankful I'm here. And I realize that in seasons like this, individually in your own lives, you maybe have things that you're anxious about, but corporately, uh, perhaps, there's anxiety. There's a little bit of fear regarding the fact that you don't know what could happen next. Uh, the reality is anxiety is a deep feeling of concern about what could potentially happen as you look toward a future that's unknown, 
and outside of your control. You see, the problem with anxiety, it really centers on this one universal truth, and this is the universal truth. We don't know what will happen next. We don't know what will happen next. This is true, right? When we look at life, there's an unpredictability when we look toward the future, and sometimes that can be scary. Sometimes that can be hard to deal with. So what do we do with that reality? How do we navigate through life when we don't know what will happen next with a sense of confidence toward the future? Well, the Apostle Paul, he wants to speak to that this morning. So as we jump into our passage, uh, the first section I want to uh, begin by unpacking for you in that very first uh, verse, verses 4 and 5, actually, I want to look at, number one, the problem this morning, the problem. So notice what Paul says, picking up in verse 4, he says these words. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Now, in these beginning verses, uh, we can identify a few different things. Paul, he begins with a command here, and it's a repetitious command. Paul begins by saying these words, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Philippians, uh, joy is the predominant theme. Paul talks about joy again and again and again, and he gives commands at various times throughout this letter, calling for the church in Philippi to rejoice. And if you notice here, the rejoicing that Paul is advocating for, that he's commanding here, it's not contingent on circumstances, right? That's why he begins by saying, rejoice in the Lord always. So that's where it begins. And then notice how he continues and says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Now, the, the word reasonableness, uh, th- this word and the original language, it's a little bit tricky to translate. Uh, so this idea here is that essentially it means that you're not someone who has to assert your own agenda when you're dealing with other people. The idea here is you're someone who is yielding, someone who is considerate to other people's needs or interests. Often this is translated as gentleness or kindness. So Paul begins by giving two different commands, two different imperatives, and then he follows up with an indicative or with a statement. Notice how he says, the Lord is at hand, meaning Jesus is coming back soon. We believe that, amen, that Jesus will return. We believe that. The Lord is coming back. The Lord is near. Now, you might be wondering, because you look like a very astute congregation, I want to say that. Uh, I don't don't know if anybody from Franklin is going to watch, but you even look more astute than my congregation, let me just say (laughs) You had just a joke, but I mean, just hopefully no one's watching. Okay. You may have noticed as I began, like I called number one, section number one, the problem, but everything I just said was like good. It was positive, right? You might be thinking that right now. Uh, uh, Paul talks about joy, rejoicing. Uh, he talks about showing reasonableness toward other people. He also talks about the nearness of Jesus. These are all good things, right? So why would I label this the problem? Well, what I want to draw from this initial section are some of the things that are underlying the reason why Paul wrote this. What lies underneath this passage? That's what I want to unpack for a moment. What is Paul trying to get at? Well, well, what I mean by that is this. Notice how in the beginning he talks about the need for finding joy, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Why would Paul even need to command this? Well, because the, the truth is in life, sometimes things happen that are difficult, that are problematic, that are a challenge. Uh, Sometimes life is hard. We face circumstances sometimes in life, and let's be honest, sometimes our circumstances, they stink. Maybe right now, this morning, there are some of you who are going through some really difficult, uh, challenging circumstances right here, right now. You're in the midst of hardship you're facing. Uh, This is certainly true for Paul. Paul, who wrote this letter to a church in Philippi, he actually wrote this while he was under house arrest in Rome. If you read through the whole letter, you'll hear at different points, Paul references this. He talks about how he's in chains as he's writing this letter to the church in Philippi. And so what's interesting here is Paul is somebody who is familiar with difficult circumstances. And so it's within this context that he gives a command to the church to rejoice Always, regardless of the circumstances you're facing, find joy that is rooted in the Lord. This is what Paul begins by doing. So the the reality is sometimes circumstances, they stink. They do. And then notice the second command. 
This idea of showing reasonableness, right? Of yielding self for the sake of somebody else, right? It's showing gentleness and kindness toward other people. Why would Paul need to command this to the Philippian church? Well, let's keep it real this morning because sometimes people stink, right? Sometimes when we navigate through life, we have to deal with difficult people. And sometimes that's hard to navigate. And this is why Paul is is commanding the church to respond to certain people in this way, showing reasonableness, showing gentleness, showing kindness. And just a heads up, so you can kind of see this for yourself, in that passage, if you go a little further up in chapter four, notice how Paul begins this chapter. He is speaking specifically to a group of, uh, of people, and there are two people uh, he, he draws reference to two ladies in the church who were having some sort of uh, fight, some sort of conflict. They were bickering, right? They couldn't get along. They just kept squabbling. Yodia and Syntyche, their names are. And so within this context, shortly after, Paul issues this command, right, to, to show reasonableness because the reality is people stink. And then finally notice the statement at the end, right? We have the two imperatives, then we have the indicative. The Lord is at hand. This is what Paul says. Now, what's the underlying problem behind why Paul would remind the people that the Lord is coming soon? Well, because the truth is the world we live in is fallen and broken. We are living in a world right now that's still operating under a curse, but one day Jesus will return, right? He has begun Right, this great work in salvation, but he has not completed that yet. We live in the already, but not yet. One day he will return, and when Christ returns, he is coming to restore and redeem all of the creation, right? All that is broken in this world, he is coming to fix. The truth is, though, until that time comes, sometimes life stinks because we're living under the curse. And so what we see here in this opening of this passage, right, uh, problems are underlying everything Paul is referencing. Problems are everywhere, whether it's challenging circumstances, whether it's difficult people, or whether it's the burden of life that we live in this fallen world that's operating under a curse. The reality is problems are everywhere. And when you take all these problems and then you couple that with the fact that we don't know what'll happen next, Well, the reality is anxiety then is going to be common. Anxiety is going to be a a, a major issue that we're prone to dealing with in life because the reality is all these things exist and we don't know what will happen next. So now that we've started this message by identifying, number one, the problem, the next thing I want to draw your attention to as we continue in this passage is, number two, the prayer. Notice what Paul says next. He writes this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. He says, let your requests be made known to God. You see, what Paul is suggesting here now in this passage is a shift in focus. Instead of thinking about our circumstances, which sometimes stink, instead of dwelling on the people around us who sometimes stink, or instead of thinking about just life, that sometimes stinks. What Paul is now saying here, and also instead of dwelling on the fact that we don't know what will happen next, Paul says, fix your eyes upward, right? Paul says, don't dwell on the stuff that's right in front of you. Don't even dwell on the stuff that you think could pop up down the road. No, fix your eyes heavenward. What Paul is advocating here is for prayer. Why? Well, because Paul knows that the remedy to anxiety is a recognition of both the the nature of God and the nurture of God. We need to understand both of these realities, both the nature of God and the nurture of God. What do I mean by that? Well, first let's consider the nature of God for just a moment. According to scripture and the songs we just sang, right? God is sovereign, but he is both sovereign and he is good. This is part of his nature. The sovereignty of God means that he is in complete control of everything that happens in this universe. Because God is omnipotent, he's all-powerful. Because God is omniscient, he's all-knowing. Because God is omnipresent, right? He's everywhere. Because God is immutable, he never changes. We can have confidence in the fact that God is always sovereignly in control of everything that happens. He governs the cosmos. He is the sovereign one who always carries out the full counsel of his will. 
Uh, over the past couple weeks, if you've noticed, looking into the heavens, we've seen some pretty remarkable things over the past couple months, haven't we? Think about this just for a moment. We had an eclipse in April. Pretty incredible to witness that, wasn't it? Now, to see that eclipse happen, it's awesome, right? And to know the fact that the moon is 380 times smaller than the sun, and yet at the same time, simultaneously, it's 380 times closer than the sun, which means from our vantage point, right, phenomenologically speaking, when we look at that eclipse happen, we see the moon pass in front of the sun, and from our vantage point, they are the exact same size from our frame of reference. It's absolutely amazing. And then, just a couple weeks ago, right, we had the Aurora Borealis, right, the Northern Lights. I'm in Frankenmuth. I'm not that far from here, so I know you guys got to experience some of that too, right? Awesome. Incredible. Uh, to know that a hyperactive sunspot sent a coronal mass ejection toward the Earth, resulting in a severe geomagnetic storm, which produced disturbances in the particles of the plasma uh, outside of the Earth, right, in the atmosphere, right? And to see, then, because of that, the dancing colors in the sky, absolutely incredible. But listen, this is not just science. This is not just astronomy. This is God, right? This is his handiwork that we get to witness. We get to see this is God at work. He holds everything together in the cosmos, in the universe, perfectly. He is totally in control because he is sovereign. He is a sovereign God. But not only is he sovereign, he's also good. This is a fundamental attribute of who God is. It's part of his nature. And we must understand, this is vitally important, that we understand both aspects of the sovereignty of God and of the goodness of God. Because if either of those two get out of whack, we have problems, don't we? I think about this just for a moment. If God is sovereign, but he is not good, we're in, we're in a tight spot, aren't we? Because that, that means that God is an evil tyrant if he is sovereign and not good. And yet, if we would affirm that God is good, but he is not sovereign, we're also in some trouble, right? Because in that case, he's a, a, a friendly rice cake. That's who God would be, right? Really, really friendly, really good, no power. We do not serve a God who is either of those things. He is both sovereign and he is good. Amen. This is part of what scripture teaches about the, the very nature of God. We need to recognize this. But not only do we need to recognize the nature of who God is, we also need to recognize the nurture of God. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, if you're familiar with that passage, right? you're moving through Matthew. You've already hit Matthew 5 and 6, 7. Great. So you're familiar Jesus goes up on the mountainside, right? And if you notice what precedes that passage, very interesting. There's a group of people who are disenfranchised and struggling with life, and they kind of navigate toward there. They're following Jesus around because of all the miracles and healings. And so they're there, they're present. Even though he's speaking to the disciples, they're there, hearing Jesus speak in this Sermon on the Mount. Uh, these are people, so just to give you some context, who are struggling and suffering with all kinds of challenges. In fact, these are people, right, they're in the region of Galilee, they're not in a large, major city, and so the reality is all these people are living below the poverty line who've gathered together to listen to Jesus share this message. These are people who are struggling with basic needs for survival, to put food on the table. They're struggling with that. These are people who are struggling to, to clothe their children, and within this context, right, this, this is the idea. These people are anxious about many things, but Jesus, in the midst of this, he begins talking about the flowers and the birds, Jesus says, if God feeds the birds, which are of little value in life, if God clothes the flowers of the field, which grow up quickly and then die off, how much more will he care for you? That's what Jesus says. You see, the truth is, God actually cares about us. He cares about me, and he cares about you, your life, your situation. God actually cares cares when you're struggling, when you're suffering, when you're dealing with difficult things in life, when it seems as if nobody cares, God always cares. Amen. We have a loving, caring God. He loves you. In fact, he loves you so much that he was willing to send his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to come and take your place and my place on a cross to endure the agony of brutal death, crucifixion. That's the whole reason why Jesus came. It was to rescue us from sin and death by dying on the cross in our place 
and then rising from the dead to reconcile us to a holy God by grace and through faith. I hope that you're believing that this morning. This is what Jesus has done for us. This is the gospel. This is the good news of what Christ has accomplished. And so because of what Jesus did, now we're part of God's family. We get to be called the children of God because he is our father now by faith in Jesus. He wants now what's best for us, his children. He nurtures us. He cares for us. He watches over us. This is why Peter, in his letter, he says, cast your anxieties on him, for he what cares for you. In the church, we can say this. that We have a God who actually cares about us. He cares about what's going on in your life and in my life. I want to assure you that he cares what's going on in this church as well. And so in this passage, Paul encourages the church of Philippi not to be anxious about stuff, but instead to fix their eyes heavenward, to remember both the nature of God and the nurture of God. God is sovereign, and he is good, and he cares for us. This is the reality. And if this is true, then as Paul says, we can make our requests known to him. We can pray about the stuff that what's going on in our life that naturally would produce anxiety or concern. We can take our fears and anxieties and cast them over to the Lord. This is what Paul advocates for. And so now that we've seen, number one, the problem, and now that we've looked at number two, the prayer, the third and final section I want to draw your attention to is the promise. Number three, the promise. The promise. We're going to turn to verse seven, but as I do this, I want to just remind you that instead of resorting to feelings of anxiety... What Paul is encouraging us to do is to pray, to make our request known to God, to identify exactly those things in our lives that would elicit fear or worry or apprehension and to give those things over to the Lord. And Paul says that when we do this, when in faith we're able to turn those issues over to the Lord that would produce anxiety in our life, what is the result? Well, here's the promise that we're given. Verse seven, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, this is a promise. It's a promise of peace. A promise of peace. Now, I want to clarify something very important. The promise here is not centered on the result of our praying. This is important to understand. God is not a magic genie. You don't rub the lamp, right? And all of a sudden, God pops out and gives you everything you want. He doesn't grant all our wishes, all our desires. That's not how it works. He's not going to guarantee that you're never going to suffer or struggle or or face hardship. That's not the way God operates. Prayer is not about eliminating every issue we face because at the end of the day, we live on this side of heaven and we're going to still suffer and struggle. In fact, if you're a follower of Jesus, expect suffering. That's what Jesus says. But if he suffered for us as followers of Christ, we are going to experience many of the same struggles in life. This is the reality. So the promise of peace here, it's not contingent on the product of our prayer. It's centered on the process of our prayers. Let me explain it this way. You see, when we release our biggest burdens and fears to the Lord, when we give those things that cause anxiety over to the Lord, the result of that kind of faith, that kind of praying, it produces in us peace. And it's a peace that's beyond our ability to fully comprehend because we can't manufacture it. We can't create it. This is why we see it's a peace that's higher and greater. It's the peace of God. The peace of God that we're given. So the idea here is when we understand both the nature and nurture of God, and then when we turn over all those things over to the Lord in faith, believing, believing and trusting that God can handle the things that we can't. The result of of that prayer, what what that process of prayer looks like, it results in peace. And peace is the antonym to anxiety. So let me ask you some questions this morning. What are you anxious about this morning? I want you to take an honest inventory of your life, search your heart, and just meditate. Meditate on what are those things right now in your life that are nagging, that are keeping you up at night, that are burdensome, worrisome. Uh, Maybe it's something going on in your marriage right now. 
Maybe you're facing some turbulent times in that relationship and things aren't going so well and you're looking toward the future and you don't have a whole lot of confidence. You don't know what's going to happen next. It's causing anxiety. Or maybe the, the source of your anxiety is something else. Maybe it's centered on your career. Maybe there's some instability at work right now. You don't know how long you're going to be able to hang on, or maybe you're searching for a career, and it's difficult. For others, perhaps your source of anxiety, it centers on issues with a family member. Maybe it's something with your kids. Or for others, maybe it's financial struggles. Or there are some of you who just look around the world and you think about how crazy things are in the world and that just produces in your mind and heart just this anxious feeling because you don't know what's going to happen. I've experienced, right, some of these feelings. In fact, that the general reality of the way the world is, right, in the U.S., it's an election year. And in case you don't know what this is like, election years produce a lot of drama in the U.S. The last one we had was 2020. Remember that year? Yeah. There are a lot of reasons to feel anxious, many reasons. Because the bottom line is we don't know what will happen next, do we? We don't. We don't know what will happen next. But you see, here's the truth that I want to remind you of this morning, and it's a big idea that I, I think is very important for us to reflect on. We don't know what will happen next, that's true, but we know who does. We, knew, we know who does, and here's the thing. He can handle it. He can. We don't know what'll happen next, but we know who does, and he can handle it. So release those things to the Lord. Give the things you're worrying about up to God. Cast your anxieties upon him. Trust him for whatever you're facing this morning. Turn your attention toward him in prayer, because let's call it what it is. Anxiety is nothing more than functional atheism. Because the reality is, if God does not reign, anxiety will. If God does not reign, anxiety will. But if there is a God, and if he is sovereign, and if he is good, and if he cares about you, then why not just let him worry about it? Let him worry about it. Let him take those burdens that you're facing, give it over to the Lord in prayer. And that way, through that kind of faith, you can experience his perfect peace. As I prepare to wrap up, I just want to share one more thing briefly I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, in my church, it was less than a decade ago that we were still dealing with, in fact, it was over a decade ago that it all started. We had transitions and challenges. I, I've been at the church now, uh, Frank and Muth Bible Church, for 13 years, and I've seen uh, significant turmoil in our church. And during those seasons of transition, there was a lot that was going on. I was burdened. I was worrisome for our church. I was fearful. And, and kind of through some of that process, while there were still transitions happening, I remember a, a situation once where I was in my car and I was driving. Uh, my, my children were much younger then. They were in the car. And my oldest son was probably about six years old at the time. And he said something to his little brother, Judah, that shocked me, absolutely shocked me. He shouted out, there is no God, Judah. Now, when I was in the car there, at first I thought, like, wait, what? I know the statistics. My wife knows the statistics, right? If you raise children uh, as a pastor, there are times statistically speaking, where that experience uh, can, can become uh, something that, that makes a child jaded, right? Because, just keeping it real with you, right? My, my kids see me, Pastor Joe, on Sunday morning, standing on a platform preaching, and then they see, see the very same person behind closed doors acting ways that sometimes aren't very pastoral. Let's just be honest. I'm a broken person. I'm a sinner in need of grace, Always. And so growing up in a pastor's home, I know the statistics, right? There are times where, where children end up becoming jaded at all that they see and they begin to walk away from the church and perhaps walk away from Christ and pursue a life apart from, from God. And so I know that that can happen, but quite honestly, I never expected it to happen so early. Six years old, 
I thought, there's no way I heard that right. No way I heard that right. But then, again, he shouted much more clearly and louder. There is no God, Judah. Well, now I knew I wasn't hearing things. I was burdened in this moment. That what was going on in my, my son's, six-year-old son's mind and heart. And so I took a moment to compose myself. And I simply asked a question. I said, Hudson, buddy, what are you talking about? Why, why are you telling your brother there is no God? And I remember looking through the, the rear view as I'm driving, and I see his face. Tears are streaming down his face. I can see he's burdened. He's troubled by something. And he lifts his eyes, and we make eye contact. And he begins to speak. And he says, Dad, we keep playing rock, paper, scissors. And every time I say rock, paper, scissors, shoot, Judah holds up a triangle and says, God. And then he says, yeah, he says, God can defeat anything. And Hudson said, Dad, it's just not fair. It's not fair. There is no God. There is no God and rock, paper, scissors, right? And he starts <laughs> sobbing. Whew. My son is not an atheist, right? Now, I tell you that story because the truth is his younger brother was right that day. God can defeat anything. He can. I have seen it with my own two eyes. I've seen it in my church. The hardship and challenge we faced, the transitions, those seasons we went through, I saw God use some of those difficult circumstances for his glory and for our good and he sovereignly used difficult circumstances and helped navigate through those in our church. And those seasons of, of trial and challenge, God ultimately used those to produce a renewed fruitfulness in the life of our church. God used hardship from the past as a means of blessing and growth and transformation in our body today. And so I want to encourage you in this church. I want to encourage the gathering here. If you're feeling anxious, not just personally, but corporately, anxious about what's going on, anxious, anxious about transition, I want to just challenge you to turn these feelings about an unknown future toward a known God. Turn toward a known God in prayer, and in doing so, experience the blessing that God provides. Find a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your goodness to us. I want to thank you that you are the sovereign God. You are in control of everything. Lord, we want to hold with intention what, what Scripture affirms to be true of you, your sovereignty and your goodness. And Lord, I also want to just reflect on the fact that you are the God who has told us that you care about us, that you care about the, the burdens that we face in life, the anxieties and challenges that we go through. I want to thank you, Lord, that we can turn to you for whatever we're facing and trust you. Lord, we don't believe that every time we pray, uh, everything's going to be magically taken care of, but Lord, we know that you are the God. Uh, you are the God who is working things together for good for those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. And Lord, we also know that you're the God who tells us that you want to take care of us, provide for us. And so, Lord, I just pray right now for this church and for the people in this room and for myself, because I need to hear this just as much, that you are a trustworthy God, that we can rely on you for our greatest burdens. Lord, we know that the greatest of all burdens has already been defeated. It's the burden of sin. Jesus vanquished sin for us so that we could experience sonship, relationship with you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to live as your children, lives filled with faith, filled with hope in who you are and what you will do. We love you. We thank you. We want to praise you. Again, for your glory and for the good of your people, we pray. Amen.